these uh, later sessions. Our next guest on stage here is leading expert in the worldwide managing partner of Bain and Company, one of the world's leading consultancy firms, and it turns out the number one place to work as well. Ladies and gentlemen, put your hands together for world leading expert Manny Maceda. <laughs> Thank you, Manny. Thank you, everybody. You know, as a guest speaker, uh, yeah. you usually have tough acts to follow. <laughs> but I really enjoyed that. Well, just don't make me cry. Yeah, so, that's the uh, only thing I ask. <laughs> so I'm actually grateful to have had a chance to, uh, to, uh, to see that performance. Thank you. Uh, happy to be here. Thank you, Louisa, for the kind introduction and for the invitation. It's, it's so nice to be in front of a large, unmasked audience speaking. I hope uh, all of you have uh, enjoyed the, the time here. Um, the topic uh, for the day that I'll talk about is uh, building a winning culture, a corporate culture, a very topical issue, and, um, you know, one that uh, uh, is very close to my, my heart. Uh, why, why does this matter? You know, I'm with my company because of a winning culture. Over 30 years ago, I'm a little older than I look, um, I was uh, after my first year of business school and I discovered this uh, industry called management consulting. I was fortunate enough as I explored it to get uh, job offers from the three largest firms of the time and the small firm with five offices in the world. It's the firm I'm still with called Bain. And um, the reason I picked the smallest one was very simple. In the course of interviewing for jobs when you're evaluating, you get to meet maybe 10 people across different firms. And in one firm, I liked, really liked three of the 10. Another one, I liked four. Another one, I liked five. One of them, I liked 10 for 10. I said, those are people I'd like to work with. They also had this very cool mission statement that I'll talk about. It was enough to convince me to spend 10 weeks of my life to join that firm, not the other three, by the way, which my parents in the Philippines had all heard of. Manny, why are you joining this firm we never heard of? It felt like these people, the culture was different. So it, it matters. And in the world we are today, we know culture matters. We know uh, companies are actually surfing, searching for talent. We know talent is searching for, for purpose, for meaning. And this is true for all companies, product companies. Now, we are a service company. This is particularly important to companies like us, which is why I think we can speak about it. You know, when you're buying great products from, from great uh, Nordic or Danish companies from Lego. I love Legos, by the way. Um, the culture of the company matters, but you're buying a product. When you work with professional service firms, the product is us. It's the people. And so if you have a winning culture that can attract, most importantly in the long run, retain people, that's a source of competitive advantage. And that's why, that's why culture matters. Um, I'll start by talking a little bit about how we build that culture. You say it's, I'll use some, it's integrated throughout each stage of human capital. You know, we now in professional services, we think of people are capital, human capital. What are the stages? Number one, you have to recruit talent and you can be, you have to be very sophisticated in who you look for. How do you make a decision? How do you make a decision to make an offer? Um, is it based on the resume? Is it based on the analytic skills they demonstrate in a complicated set of interviews? Or can you be more sophisticated than that? Can you predict this person will be a good teammate? This person will be loyal because if they stay for one year, it's not as good as if they stay for 10 or 20 or 30 in my case. Will this person be a decent human being and care and not get you into trouble? Recruiting matters. Developing them matters a lot. 
Can you train people, grow them, and then ultimately in the world today, retain them? You'll read articles going on around us on the great resignation. You know, everyone is thinking from young to uh, experienced, what do I want to do with the rest of my life? Do I, go, do I want to go back to work? Should I have more purpose? So if you can build a system as we have for many, many years, that is about recruiting, developing, ultimately retaining talent, it's actually a winning formula. Bain invented a concept many years ago called NPS for customers, the Net Promoter Score. Customer loyalty is one of the best predictors of success of a company. There is a high, high, high correlation for many companies between customer loyalty and talent loyalty. So this is a pretty important imperative. And that's worked for us. That's why I can speak of this with a little bit of authority. Um, you know, this year, Glassdoor, as measured by employee feedback, rated as the number one uh, place to work, not in our industry of any company in the United States. We've won that a few more years. And then over the years, we've said, well, is, is, it is it good enough to be the number one place to work in general? Or should you also be the number one place to work for women, for minorities, for LGBT teammates, not just for the senior people in the firm? So we've tried to build this culture that has worked for many years. It's why, hopefully, I'm still here. It's what I hope for that, that next young summer associate who has choices will choose to, to stay longer. And what I thought I would do is share a little bit of insight into how we do that. And hopefully this is applicable to you no matter what company you're in. We're a global firm. We're very proud to be uh, uh, doing quite well and represented in Denmark and throughout the Nordics. But here's, here's some of the pillars. Purpose and mission is the starting point. A company has to have a clear mission, a North Star. Most employees now, when they join a company, we actually, we, we track the data, three out of four of them will say, the company's mission matters to me. I want to be proud of this company. I want to know they're making a difference in the world. That's always the starting point. Second, you have to have behaviors that reinforce that purpose. Companies, employees, customers, they're pretty sharp when you're authentic, when you're not, when the purpose is just words as opposed to something that actually is embedded in how the people that make up a company interact. It's kind of why those 10 people I met many years ago, and hopefully people today will still say, I met someone from your firm. I travel all over the world. I used to, anyway. And now I travel all over the world via Zoom. Um, and I'm happy to be here in person. But so many people say, I've met someone for a company, they're like this. That means it's consistent. Second is reinforcing behaviors that um, is everything you do day to day reinforcing that mission and purpose. You're top down. You know, what not just the CEO says, but what everybody says. Third, in order to uh, build a winning culture, you have to keep learning and developing. You have to invest so much and treat it as strategic investment. When we're all making trade-offs on financial capital, how much are you spending on people, on talent, on training, versus everything else we have, we have to do? And lastly, you have to keep innovating. Because guess what? While much of these cultural things change over many years, um, the world is constantly changing, and, and I'll comment on that. These are the pillars on how you can build the culture, reinforce it, act on it. Now, I'll share Bain's example on those four to the extent it's relevant to you and, and maybe share some personal experiences. That firm I joined, 1988 uh, to be specific, had a mission. It's a services mission in service of our clients, to help clients create such high levels of economic value that together we set new standards of excellence. It was a, a, an off, a firm with five small offices. Said, 
That inspired me. But when I was privileged enough to be asked to serve as our chief executive three years ago, the question you ask is, does this mission still resonate in today's world? I just came from uh, COP26. I spent a few days in Glasgow. I was struck at how many chief executives I talked to were revisiting their purpose and mission, you know, around adding sustainability to some of the principles and behaviors like IKEA has. I chose to make one simple edit. Delete the word economic. And the rest of it still hangs together. Most of us grew up in a world where the original purpose of a corporation, as defined by Milton Friedman perhaps in the early 1970s, was to meet the needs of your shareholders. And that's not true anymore. You know, as an American CEO of a global company, I'm also a member of a group called the Business Roundtable in the U.S. Two years ago, we redefined the statement of purpose of a corporation to have multiple stakeholders. You have to serve the needs of your customers, your employees, your ecosystem, your communities, and yes, also your shareholders. And but all of them care. So for us, a simple edit of deleting one adjective from a mission statement that's meant so much to some people, spoke volumes. People got it. Some of the more senior people said, Manny, what the hell are you doing? <laughs> are you allowed to do that? You know, you're not the CEO, you're the managing partner. There's a difference in the partnership. But for our team, our staff, yes, I want to be proud to work for NGO clients on a pro bono basis. I want to know that my work is mat matters in addressing ESG needs. So, having the right, some people call it purpose, some people call it mission, some overarching North Star that your employees get, why you do it, why are you in existence as a company, that's typically the starting point. And a lot of companies around the world, including many of our clients, are going through a process right now to update their missions and purpose because of what's happening in the world. You can't do this that often. <laughs> By definition, this has to span a pretty meaningful amount of time. Second, uh, on top of that, would be to have a set of what I called earlier reinforcing behaviors. For us, these are five operating principles. I won't spend too much time on this um, because every, I hope every one of your companies has a set of behaviors that you would recognize. Some of these, uh, th because of the, uh, the, the internal lingo, I'll just call out. True North, what does that mean? An internal compass to do the right thing. Do you know where True North is? You know, not, not North as designed by a compass that might be off by a little bit. That's inside you. And to always be guided by that. Um, practical and at cost. What does at cost mean? in our language. At effect is the opposite of at cost. If your world, if you, if you react to what the world throws at you, you are the effect and you, you deal with the effects versus being the cause, being proactive. And, and so a few more others. Uh, it's very important for most companies to have a clear set, whatever you call it, different company call, call these different things, Operating principles, reinforcing behaviors that are thoughtfully built. And last year, while we were in the middle of this global pandemic, for the first time in almost 30 years, we first built the original set of operating principles in 1995. We refresh this with a lot of input from the talent we have today. That's also a good process to, go, to do, not that often, and by the way, we took them from 10 down to 5. So if you have the right purpose, if you have the right um, operating principles, then we get to reinforcing behaviors. I was in a Q&A earlier, and people asked, what are you going to talk about? Well, how do you actually do this as leaders? Um, we go around the loop. Reinforcing behaviors. You, the management, the leadership, all the way up to me, we have to, 
you know, we have to not just talk the talk, we have to walk the walk. We, we have to do it as, as leaders, make, make the choices, be out there. You know, a lot of what defines Bain today is extremely close to my heart because it was a company I joined many years ago. It was mostly, you know, a senior white male American-led firm. And I was a kid from the Philippines who joined this firm, and now we're a global firm, diverse in so many ways, constantly trying to make decisions um, to, uh, to reinforce the mission and the purpose. And you can connect the dots. We made the decision, for example, two months ago, I don't know if it's controversial here, to mandate vaccinations for a team. That was, we viewed as a decision that I could make from the top to reinforce the value for us of getting people to work together physically and not just virtually and make people feel safe. So you always have to have leadership reinforce your values. Second, uh, feedback loops. When I spent uh, uh, 10 weeks as a young summer intern many years ago, something really surprised me about that experience, and it's stayed with me till today. I had a chance as a young summer intern to present a case uh, to a client. That might be risky. I was, I was excited. You know, I seemed to have done well. The senior executive on Bain, the partner, sat me down and gave me feedback. That's a classic feedback loop. Manny, here's three things you did well, and here's two things you could do better. I'm not sure if that was the appropriate ratio. We think about that, but three positive... And then he surprised me and he, by saying, you also heard me do my part of the presentation today. You have feedback for me. In fact, I'd, I'd ask it. That always stuck with me. You know, I'd been with the firm for four weeks, the senior partners asking me for feedback. Is this a trick question? And uh, he was legitimate, and so I, I did my best. So feedback loops matter. We think about feedback in a small loop, meaning tactical, uh, feedback after a meeting, feedback after a team, and a big loop. Once a year, actually in this market, once a quarter, we do a proper uh, employee NPS, would you recommend working at this company the way we ask for our customers? Feedback matters. Third, storytelling, moments of truth, right? It's the little things that reinforce a company's culture and behaviors, especially as you globalize. I had lunch today with the chief executive of one of the great uh, global companies uh, based here. You know, they were telling me they have a large operation in India. And somehow the Danish leadership team, well, it's a global leadership team downtown, but it has picked up cricket so that you can, in, in the language, so when you talk to your many thousands of Indian employees who turned out care about cricket more than any other thing, you know, those are little things that the team cared about. We do lots of uh, things like that. Last, a fourth, reinforcement in the operating model of the company. Are you reinforcing your behaviors with talking the talk on promotions? Are you talking the talk on compensation? People know in companies who got promoted and were they good role models? And are you making the trade-off between business performance and team performance? And then, you know, last, um, measurement and reporting. This is uh, one of the interesting side comments from uh, uh, COP26, uh, which is still going on, but at least my trip. A number of, uh, in a number of meetings, people said jokingly, the key to ESG, the key to decarbonization, the key to sustainability is accountants. They were half joking, but pretty serious. We can't, unless it's measured, unless you actually can track progress, unless you put the measurements in the company's reward systems, you know, my, my success, my evaluation, my compensation 
is directly related and influenced by how well I do, and that's true throughout the company, on leading people and having talent that actually still believes this is the best place to work. So this was enough to keep us successful for the last few years. Now the question is, are things changing dramatically? Are we in a different world in 2021 as we come out of the pandemic if you're in Copenhagen? Or maybe you're still deeply in the pandemic as, you, as we are in some parts of Asia. So I would, I would just uh, uh, comment on a few things. There are ongoing multi-year secular trends that are reshaping the future of work. We're familiar with some of them. Automation, machine learning, are humans needed for specific jobs? Um, the generational shift, the interest of the, the Gen Z, in my case, how, I have four children, you know, my wife and I uh, raised, hopefully successfully, four good people. But their mindsets are very different from my generation. Gig economy, flender, gender parity, purpose. On top of that, we've just lived through, depending on where you are, a year, 18 months, well, probably two years of COVID, which have added even more pressures to talent. We all learned, I learned, to my surprise, I can run a global company from my bedroom. It's not as enjoyable necessarily. I'm happy to be in London and Glasgow and Copenhagen and Stockholm as I'll be in this trip, but gosh, it's more efficient. And it clearly gave us a much lower carbon footprint. So we have a number of things that COVID is um, has actually accelerated that makes you question, do the talent models, do the things you need to do to build a winning culture change? Job fluidity. Um, the importance of mental health. You know, the fact that all of us as companies, as we saw our workers all working in small rooms doing Zoom, um, and the emotional and mental toll, all of that takes seriously. So these are affecting the future of work for sure. And then you, on top of that, have a different role that business and society is entering. I mentioned earlier, it used to be shareholder primacy. Now it's stakeholder capitalism. Um, sustainability, diversity, purpose, net zero, mission. These are now what define what our workforce want to work on, what companies they want to work for. And so you add these things with the ongoing secular trends and the, uh, the new COVID-related trends, it clearly is reshaping the uh, talent model of the future in a few different ways. I'll summarize a few. It, every organization has to have a stronger sense of person, purpose, mission, and impact. If you don't, you will not be able to attract and retain the best business talent, the best talent, period. The workforce has to be more diverse, more inclusive in all aspects of diversity. You know, sex, gender, race, global history, very, very different skills. Um, there has to be more flexibility. People can choose a little bit why I work, where I work, when I work, and we have to empower them. Um, there is an increasing specialization because of the distance issue. The best person for this job may not be in Copenhagen, might be in Bangalore, might be in San Francisco, for where I'm from. And then often you have a specialist background to do that role, but because of technology, you can bring it to your team. This one, um, having workers organized in cross-functional teams, uh, we've been at this for a long time as a company that works by definition in cross-functional teams. The original thesis of a corporation in the most efficient way is organize functionally, 
get deep experience, get more effective. But so much of what has to be done now is cross-functional. And cross-functional can now happen because of technology from many, many different places in the world. Uh, a couple of more. Automation will continue. That will create challenges and potentially inequality. The impact of all of the technologies on jobs is one of probably going to be one of the defining issues of the 2020s. And then last, more dynamic career pathways. So think about all of these influencing our talent models, and then maybe ask some questions along the way. Are these, uh, are these internally consistent? No. No. A lot of these things will come in direct conflict with each other. And so your strategies as a company have to balance so many things into account. And I'll, I'll probably wrap by saying something that at the beginning is why this matters so much for us. I think it matters for all. There is the needs of your customers, the needs of your investors, the needs of your workforce, they're often not independent forces pulling each other. In particular, customers and employees are very, are very, very interlinked. And so we, we happen to be at a point in time in the world where more than ever, we have to figure out for all of us, whether you're a you know, global firm, uh, with a leader in San Francisco like I am, or a Danish firm, or a Nordic firm, being able to attract, develop, retain, you know, the, the talent, the people, that's going, to be, that's going to be the single most important factor in whether we're going to succeed, you know, as corporations in the, in the years to come. And uh, I'm honored to be able to share some of that thoughts with you. And Look forward to a nice chat with my friend Luisa as uh, hopefully we deepen this dialogue. But thank you very much. Thank you. Thank Manny, you. thank you. Thank you. Have a seat, please. We'll continue. Um, by all means, get your Slido questions in. Go to the Slido app. Uh, you know by now it's PS21 is the, um, the code. And then you can send your questions through to, uh, to Manny. Uh, Manny, please, I know you've been asked a gazillion times to tell the story with regards to Jack Welsh and the grenade-like object. Oh. And, but I ask you for a reason, and I'll come to that after you tell the story, which you can do in your own words better. You were at MIT. Okay. Uh, so this is, I was a second-year student at uh, the business school of MIT. My business idol of the time was uh, the, the head of the world's largest corporation, Mr. Jack Welch. Um, as part of the student committee, I invited him to speak. He came to campus. I introduced him, you know, the way you introduced me, and then I left to sit over there while he gave, we got up to give his talk. Um, someone in a hazmat suit came running down the center aisle, dropped a, uh, um, a fuming pail, so it wasn't a grenade, which some people have uh, talked grenade. about, and uh, jumping jack, jumped forward, a, a few people dashed, what is this, is this an, is this an incident? Um, I, I put a hanky over my mouth and I kind of had a suspicion what it was, I grabbed it and brought it out. It was uh, dry ice and water for people who were, um, you know, protesting some of uh, General Electric's, you know, environmental impact in their factories at the time. So that's a little bit, you know, uh, what happened and then you know, what, what's probably less known is the, the coda to that story is I got a handwritten note from Welch two days later inviting me to lunch at corporate headquarters in, uh, in Fairfield, Connecticut. And then, you know, he, he had me spend, well, he ended up giving me basically, who would you like to work for, this, this, this person or that person? And, so this Je Jeff Immelt joined, Jeff Immelt, who later would become the chairman yeah, so of the Yeah, so, you know, I'm, I'm, a, st I'm a student, and I, I sat down at the corporate dining room of General Electric, which I didn't know those existed, with a tuxedoed waiter who gave me my menu in the table 
with Jack and two other executives. And, uh, and Jack said, okay, you spend the afternoon with Tom, who ended up being the head of M&A. And what did I learn at the time? That GE pretty much had a valuation on every company in the Fortune 500 and had an investment thesis on whether they should buy them or sell one of their portfolio. And then tomorrow, spend the morning with this fellow, Jeff, who was the chief marketing officer of their plastics business. And I had a history in chemical engineering plastics. So anyway, and then turns out the second fellow became, was Jeff Immelt. I wouldn't remember that till many years later. And, and they both offered you jobs. Yeah, so Jack called me after that, says, okay, do you want to work for Tom or do you want to work for Jeff? I said, Jack, thank you. I'm honored. Um, I really loved my 10 weeks in my summer at Bain & Company in San Francisco. I'm going to go back there, but someday I'd love to work for you. That, that's, uh, that's, yeah. that's kind of how that played out. And so in other words, something happened to a very high-profile person on stage, and you were the only person who actually took action to get it out, right? So, and, and that can also, I mean, many can say, what's a, what, where do leadership skills come from? You know, we talk about, like, the transformational agenda. We talk about leadership. Like, like wh why do you think that you got up and removed that and not somebody? Like, where, how do you breed leadership? You know, in, in, I mentioned about how do you recruit talent. I, I'll tell you what I was thinking at the time. Um, and you could say, you know, gee, that's kind of a stupid thing to do. You should have dashed off. I, my only responsibility is I invited the person, right? So there was a protective instinct. If there's anything wrong here, it's not like I threw my body over a grenade or no, anything. No, I understand, I know? understand. But it's like, that's my guest. This is something going on. It should be... So I, it, you didn't even think, right? You just, you just did it. And you say, you know, I don't know that I'd say that's good leadership behavior. I, I do think it's important to... To, you know, part of leadership is protecting your organization and taking on some of the challenges, challenges yourself. And so I, I'm, I'll probably overinterpret that, Louise. No, no <laughs> I just, I always think it's interesting, you know, some take action on certain things, some don't. I get what you're saying that you invited, but, you know, you, you guys, you've been voted, you know, best place to work a number of times, right? Like, I mean, why? Why, why, why do you think that there is a good culture, a good leadership culture, obviously, or, you know, yes, it's reflecting you, but that it's also, it's a, it's a broader culture, otherwise, otherwise you wouldn't be voted number one place to work for, you know, a number, a number of years, right? So. I think it's because it is part of the mission statement, I read the earlier part, um, you know, to create such high levels of value. There's a second part of that mission statement, this mission requires a community of extraordinary teams. That's for us, that's language for make it, keep it the best place to work. And so for leadership to always be trying to role model that and to protect an organization, protect your team. And you know, leaders make decisions every day that are sometimes hard. You know, I, I, the decision we made in early September to mandate vaccinations for United States employees. We didn't publicize that, right? There's leaders, leaders sometimes, um, you know, actions, words sometimes matter, but actions should speak louder than words. Um, yeah. th I think that, that was an example. Well, why are you doing that? It's a safety issue. It's an emotional issue. It makes our firm stronger if we get our people back into the offices or back into our clients. Mm -hmm. And if the only way to do that is to make people feel comfortable that we're vaccinated, then yes, let's make that, let's make that decision. I know that's, and that's, that's frankly been happening now in, in the United States. I, I think we're probably not so much here yet because for various regulations. But. Let me get to some questions mm -hmm. that are coming in. Um, what is the single most effective thing you've done during your career, not as a corporate manager, but as a leader of people? Single most effective thing. You know, I've, uh, I've tried to invest uh, directly into our training programs. I'd say, um, if, if you, if you um, subdivide your job and say, you know, my job is 
generating revenues, serving the needs of our clients, developing intellectual property. And someone else's job is to build a team, develop the team, train the team so that I have, I have people who can serve those needs. Then you've lost the plot a little bit. So I, I think uh, for me having always spending some part of my time on training and, and development is probably a key. You know, our, our training is done internally. We don't outsource it that much. Um, and every two years you, get, you spend a week, even partners, even senior partners in our firm. And every year I, I go to, to at least two training programs as a trainer. And then I try to learn from others, which we can have a separate conversation too. <laughs> Um, you were mentioning uh, how important culture is. Uh, how do you support culture with so many employees working from home? Frankly, it's hard. Um, this, uh, this issue of, you know, we, we've made a commitment, um, and I'd like, I'd like even our team here to challenge us to hold it, to still be the best place to work in the future, right? And so, if you look at so many things that reinforce culture when we, were, when we were in the office together or the client's locations together, the team building, the mentoring, the apprenticeship, the, uh, you know, the drinks at the bar late at night to share life experiences, can, can you do all that? So, our mission, our commitment is yes. And we've had to use technology in a different way. But I'd say it's challenging. And so we believe the answer is going to have to be some hybrid version that keeps the benefit of working from home, autonomy, flexibility of hours, lower carbon footprint, with some of the things you can't get working alone at home, mentorship, training, relationship being, we are a social species, homo sapiens. So we, we have to do both. And part of the reason, Louisa, we chose to, uh, to do a, a vaccine mandate in the United States, um, which, you know, we've looked at regulations. We strongly, strongly, strongly encourage it everywhere else in the world. But we, we don't think, at least our legal uh, um, recommendations, is we can't actually mandate it. Um, but we strongly encourage it, is because we actually think part of the answer is it can't be 100% work from home. You can, I'm sorry? Part of the answer to your question is it cannot be 100% work from home if you're going to try to at least do some of the aspects of, you know, of uh, winning cultures that companies like us have. Um, you've climbed the corporate ladder uh, quite well. <laughs> to say the least. Which qualities or skills helped you to stand out among your colleagues and achieve your current position? And, and add on to that, what would you look for in people you're hiring today? It's hard to self-judge. Um, so I'll, I'll tell you one thing that has mattered to me from the beginning, and I still look for that in hiring. And I'll simplify it by saying, can you, see, can you see the big picture? It's a little trite, but what does that mean? Um, you know, for, for us as organizations, the big picture is anchored back in the mission. Right? How do you create such high levels of value? Shareholder value, customer value, stakeholder value. I actually think that is a mindset and a skill. So I. Not, not because I feel I'm strong that way. I actually differentially look for that for people. What does a big picture mean? Most people in, uh, in, um, in an organization or even in a client engagement are working on a very, on a relatively narrow topic. Let's say you're working on, should we change the price of this product? You know, my, the Christmas present my kids gave me in advance of Christmas, which I can't wait, uh, R2D2 Lego you know, which I'm going to do on the morning of December 25, you know. And um, so let's say the product is, should you change the price? That might be what I'd call a narrow picture. Right? 
What's the big picture? Well, the biggest picture of all is how do you make Lego a really great company? And if you can connect the dots from pricing a product or improving a finance function to the ultimate mission, you know, is Lego going to be more valuable? Will it meet the needs of more shareholders? I actually think that is a, that is a skill. And I do think as a, as a chief executive, you have to see the biggest picture of all. And often the picture is not just inside your company, it's, it's outside what's going on in the world. And so... <laughs> Can performance outperform a bad or poor cultural fit? You know, I'll, I'll, I'll go back. Uh, Jack Welch uh, has uh, you know, passed away many years ago, but um, he used to have this very simple matrix, um, and, and that's a lesson. I've tried to pick up lessons from different people I've known and worked with over the years, and consultants like to think in two-by-two two matrices, by the way. So one dimension, is there good performer, not so good performer? Do they hit their numbers or not? And the second dimension is, you know, are they a good teammate or are they a good, they good people person or not? And Welch always said the hardest quadrant was the person who delivered on their numbers but was not a great people person. Um, in our firm, that quadrant is not acceptable. You know, that might be okay for one quarter and you get feedback, but you have, if, you know, and by, if you haven't improved on that, ultimately this is not the place for you. And, and, and part of maybe the flexibility of a private firm is, you know, we can do that. But that's very consistent with reinforcing behaviors and the values. There are some firms, by the way, out there, so I don't mean that this model fits for everybody, that will say performance is the one that matters the most, and they'll take it. And I, I kind of think that's, that's relatively short-sighted. Um, uh, Tons and tons of, of questions coming through. We're, we're running out of time. Should we do uh, three last ones? Yes. Um, uh, uh, excuse me, it's jumped. I had one, a good one here we hadn't touched on. Um, but it just jumped. Give me one second. Yes. When you are consulting, do you think your firm's culture needs to be similar to the client's? Oh. Um. Good question. And, and maybe values in their values or ethics or? Uh, I would say increasingly there has to be some alignment. And, and I'll say some extremes. It's definitely easier, you know, in a talent-based organization with people in our firm who can choose to work on topics or not. And so, you know, we're, we're not a command and control, you know, Louisa, you have to work on that client on that topic. Right? That's, that's not the nature. I would say when there is a sympath sympathetical culture and values fit, it's a lot easier. And then there's a set where it's different, but then you sort of rationalize a little bit. Part of our mission to help our clients set new standards of excellence might be to be a change agent to help them evolve their culture. And then there could be companies, and there are companies and industries will just say, we won't work. We just won't work for them. You know, it's too inconsistent. You know, the, the, uh, we, we sort of have this, you know, you have to be nice. You have to be decent. You know, and so if, if, uh, if an organization is like that, it's life's too short. Because our people would quit. And back to the issue of, uh, you know, this is a supply-constrained uh, environment for the foreseeable future. I know I said three uh, questions, but we are out of time. I'm getting messages. Uh, to wrap it up, as a takeaway for people, if they want to go back to their workplaces and implement something, like what, what would the key takeaway be? Like what, as, uh, with a consultant hat on, <laughs> what, what would you say in I general you should go back and, and do? I'm both, a, I'm both a consultant and, uh, and a line leader. So I'd, I'd yeah. like take the message ser seriously that uh, we're going to be in a world in the next few years where building talent loyalty is going to be so key to our ability to become, to, to do good businesses. 
And so if you take that as a mindset and say, what are the things you can do to build talent loyalty, help shape the purpose and mission of the company, you can all influence that, help build and role model the reinforcing behaviors consistent with that mission, then make sure in any role that you have that the uh, operating systems are fully configured. Uh, I think if you do that, we'll, uh, we'll have a chance to all be uh, great companies in the, in the years to come. And thank you for the chance to uh, address you today. Manny, thank you so much for joining on stage. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Really, really fascinating. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. Thank, thank you. you. If you go back, thank you. Fascinating, ah, fascinating corporate culture.